Hi, this is Tim Could Travels, and today we are in the, the southeast, southeast of England. Of England. The area south of London contains Surrey, Sussex and Kent and is one of the most desirable and expensive places to live in the UK. We spent five days in Sussex and toured the whole region in October. Which explains why the sun rarely came out because England's not really known for its sunshine. Um, it's the sunniest region of the country? Uh, we have the Côte d'Azur in France, now that's a sunny south coast. We start in Winchester, the capital of the Kingdom of Wessex, which was one of the larger kingdoms in Saxon Britain before England became England. Its most famous inhabitant was Alfred the Great. Now, what do we know about Alfred, Jeremy? Okay, he managed to get the English kingdoms to stop fighting amongst themselves and fight back against the Vikings, uniting England for the very first time, even if it was just temporarily. Oh, I didn't expect you to know that much about him. Well, you know, he was a character in Vikings, the TV drama. Chichester is a lovely little town. So much so that it is the most sought after place to live in the entire country for people when they retire. The South East is littered with its signature oast houses and windmills. So keep your eyes peeled for the stunning structures poking out of the rolling English countryside. Things I didn't know, that the Battle of Hastings didn't actually happen in Hastings, they happened in battle. So surely it should be the Battle of Battle. Um, how do you feel about being in the spot where the French conquered the English and haven't been conquered since? Very powerful. Mm hmm. You're a very powerful nation. Indeed. Are you going to conquer us again? Oh, yes. So the weather wasn't kind to us when we visited. So much so that Jeremy had a little hissy fit on day two and decided it wasn't even worth trying to take photos in colour and ditched his signature colourful style. Look, grey skies ruin everything. Black and white hides a lot of sins. It's not my fault it rains all the time in England. Anyway, doesn't Rye look gorgeous in full monochrome village kit realness? Mm -hmm. In the song Sing a Song of Sixpence and a Pocket Full of Rye, how exactly did they get the rye into their pocket? Thankfully, the sun did eventually come out, just in time for us to see the world-famous White Cliffs. The Seven Sisters and Beachy Head are one of the most iconic views in England, synonymous with the identity of Britishness itself. Alright, Vera Lynn. There'll be bluebirds over the White Cliffs of Dover. Except Dover is 75 miles away. Yes, but they're still white. I took home a piece of chalk from the beach as a memento, but then my coat got covered in it. Funny that. Day three, and we head to Brighton, the most famous of all of Britain's seaside resorts. The favoured summer day trip of all Londoners, in the middle of it is the famed Brighton Palace Pier. Built in 1899, the pier has been an amusement attraction ever since. Though its theatre is now closed, the structure is now home to an amusement park, arcades and the all-important British seaside vendors selling fish and chips, candy floss and the famous Brighton Rock. Oh! Only one two! Have you just won something? <laughs> Four P. <laughs> I am absolutely determined that I'm going to get that deck chair. Ah. Come on. Yes. I've won two coins. It 
In summer, Brighton is crowded with sun worshippers, lining the shore with a good portion of the population of London on one of the six days per year the sun comes out. Oi! This isn't Manchester. The sun does come out down south. But when the sun does come out, Brighton is a seaside paradise with a wide promenade and striking landmark across the city. Including Brighton Pavilion, the seaside retreat built by George IV in 1811. Another landmark is the remains of the West Pier. It was built in 1866 but collapsed in 2002 and burnt out in a fire the following year. The remains are quite hauntingly beautiful on a windy day, don't you think? You can get views of the seafront from the I-360 tower for the price of a small house. There are plenty of little attractions along the seafront. So make sure you walk as far as Hove Lawn so you can see the beautiful pastel painted beach huts. Day four and we head to Dover. Where it rained. A lot. Cue the black and white photos once again. Our next stop is a famed Canterbury, the medieval cathedral city and UNESCO World Heritage Site. The spiritual home of the Anglican faith, it's the seat of the Archbishop of Canterbury, one of the most powerful people in the UK. Which, as a secure Frenchman, I find somewhat problematic. Mm, it is what it is, but Canterbury is a picturesque little city, with quaint medieval streets revolving around its vast cathedral complex. Although, as we discovered, it's near impossible to get a view of the building itself without paying a hefty fee to get inside the complex, which has as much security as Fort Knox. However, once you're inside, there's no doubt that this is an impressive structure, both in terms of its scale and its decor. Founded in 597, the majority of the building was constructed in the 11th century, before being extensively extended after thousands of pilgrims started to descend on the site daily after the martyrdom of Thomas Becket. Becket was a childhood friend of the King Henry II, but their relationship turned sour when the priest was invested as Archbishop, beginning years of conflict between church and state. Reportedly, Henry exclaimed to his courtiers, Will no one rid me of this turbulent priest? And someone took it as an instruction, murdering him in the north transept of the cathedral. Can we play a game? Uh, I'll be Henry II and you can be Thomas Beckett. But why? I don't want to die. Pilgrimages to Canterbury were so popular in the Middle Ages that Geoffrey Chaucer immortalised them forever in the Canterbury Tales, which is remembered as one of the most accomplished pieces of early English literature, which I didn't love studying on my A-level English course. On our last day, we thought it high time to visit a palace. There are a lot of them, with highlights including Leeds Castle, Hever Castle and High Clare, the shooting location for Downton Abbey. But we chose Hampton Court, on the outskirts of London, which was the home of England's most famous monarch of all. Tourists often assume that the English monarchy has always lived in and around Buckingham Palace, but no, they would be wrong. While the Tower of London housed the monarchy throughout the medieval times and later the Palace of Westminster, that all changed when Henry VIII had a disagreement with his advisor, Cardinal Wolsey, who had just built Hampton Court in Richmond-upon-Thames. In an attempt to curry favour, the Cardinal gave his vast new crib to Henry. Did it work? Of course not. The Cardinal died in disgrace just a year later. Though the British kings and queens would continue to live in the palace until the 18th century, its most famous residents were its earliest ones. Elizabeth I lived there, overseeing the Golden Age of England, with Shakespeare performing his plays in its chambers fairly regularly. But in terms of gossip and scandal, it's her father, Henry VIII, who filled this red brick palace with his trademark promiscuity and now legendary six wives. From the pious loyalty of Catherine of Aragon to the licentiousness of Catherine Howard, headstrong Anne Boleyn to righteous Jane Seymour, famously plain Anne of Cleves to motherly Catherine Parr, they all walked the halls of Hampton Court. That was until they were periodically divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived.
Why do you hate Henry VIII? Because I can't see his palace. Why can't we see the palace? Hidden by mushroom trees. I hate the mushroom trees. Although to be fair, they look quite cool. Yeah, true. But I want to see the palace. Outside, the landscape gardens are in the 17th century style. Despite the fact that the mushroom trees get in the way of seeing it, I would venture that Hampton Court is probably Britain's most impressive palace. Which is your favourite of Henry VIII's wives and why? Well, I only know two. You're a terrible British person. <laughs> Go on, well, which, I, which two French. do you know? I know Catherine of Aragon mm -hmm. and Anne Boleyn. And which is your favourite of the two? Oh, Catherine of Aragon. Why? She's Spanish. Just because she's European. <laughs> That's right. I see. Mine is, uh, my favourite is Anne of Cleves because she was really ugly. Oh, okay. Actually, no, I quite like Catherine Howard because she was a right old hoe. We've just skimmed the surface of the things you can see and do in and around the southeast of England. So, whether you're from the UK or visiting from abroad, there's plenty here and it's all within an hour or two from London. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like, share and subscribe, but most importantly, subscribe and follow us on Instagram at Team Quirt Travels where you can see all of my amazing photographs. Yes, yes, Jeremy, we are perfectly aware of the fact that all of the photographs are yours, but make sure that you tune in next time to find out where in the world we end up next. Until next time, folks. See ya. Bye. And don't forget to subscribe. Bye. <laughs>